What on earth are you wearing? You can't go to school looking like that. Take it off immediately. Mom screeched. The horrified look on her face would make you think she caught me trying to sneak out in a skimpy outfit. Truth was, I was wearing a beautiful dress and had my hair tied in a ponytail. And since when is your hair that long? And you dyed it? I'd worn a beanie all summer. Mom had no idea how long my hair had grown. I didn't dye it, Mom. I just let it grow back to its natural color. I want to look different this time. You look horrible. I can't believe you'd do this to us. To them, I was confused. I tried to stand my ground, but she dragged me to the bathroom and cut my hair, then dyed it black. I hate you and I hate school. I screamed at the top of my lungs. That's enough, Erin. Now get rid of that dress and wear your normal clothes. Hurry or you'll be late on your first day at your new school. Mom answered me sternly. Normal? They're all boys' clothes. I don't want to wear boys' clothes anymore, I said tearfully. <laughs> Ever since I was a little girl, my parents dressed me as a boy. I didn't realize that they were boy clothes until elementary school when everyone started to mock me. I often came home crying, but my parents never bought me girl clothes like I begged them to. A few weeks ago, when mom told me that we'd be moving to a different town, I was so happy. Kids at my old school were so mean and I always dreaded going to school. I was now a senior and I thought I'd finally get to pick my own clothes. My aunt had paid me to babysit my cousin all summer and when we moved, I used the money to buy new outfits. I'm not gonna ask you again, Erin. Go to your room and change. Hi guys, my name is not Erin. And I'm not a boy, even though my parents always make me dress like one. Want to know why? Watch till the end. I tearfully took off my dress and started to wear the clothes mom had laid on my bed. She grabbed the dress from my hands and tore it into pieces. At school, I received so many stares. My hair was unevenly cut due to mom's outburst that morning. While some students whispered behind my back, others laughed openly, pointing at me. I didn't blame them. I was an easy target. As long as you live under our roof, you'll wear the outfits we buy you. Is that clear? Dad said at dinner later that evening. Why were my parents so obsessed with me dressing and looking like a boy? I was so miserable. Please don't get me wrong. You can wear any clothes you want to, as long as you are comfortable in them. But no one should force you to wear something you don't want to, like my parents were doing. Aaron, hey, I got tickets for us to go watch the football this weekend. I hated football. Dad always made me watch it, saying that it was a way for us to bond. I can't go this weekend. The annual talent show at school is in a few weeks and I'm participating. That's great, Aaron. What will you be presenting? I wrung my hands nervously. I wished I could tell them that I was planning to design a dress and wear it at the talent show. I had an eye for fashion and at school, art and design was my favorite class. I, I can't tell you yet, dad. It's a surprise. The next day, I went to the mall and bought a sewing kit and other tools I'd need to make the dress. I picked a few outfits from my closet and cut them into pieces. By the time I was done, I had enough material to make my new dress. The talent show was being held at the school auditorium. The dress had come out great, and when I tried it on, I was so proud of myself. I looked fantastic in it. My turn to do my presentation came and I was so nervous. What if people laughed at me like they always did? How would my parents react? They were both sitting in the audience eagerly waiting to see what my presentation was. When I walked to the stage, everyone gasped in utter surprise. After announcing the dress as my original design, I proudly walked around swaying my ponytail side to side, flaunting my gorgeous dress. I could tell the judges were impressed, but the moment was short-lived. My mom stormed the stage and grabbed me by my ponytail and literally dragged me away. Everyone stared in shock, wondering what was happening. Let go of me, you're hurting me. I protested as she continued to drag me through the parking lot to her car. Ma'am, you need to release her now. Miss Vera, my art and design teacher, came running out of the auditorium, followed by a few other students. Soon, a crowd formed around us. She went against our wishes by wearing this ugly dress. Your daughter is very talented. The dress is beautiful and it looks great on her. I was so embarrassed by mom's behavior. You're ruining my life. I don't want to look like a boy anymore. I screamed at mom. That's enough, Aaron. Get in the car. We're leaving. My name is not Aaron, and I'm not going anywhere with you. Do you need our help? Yes, my parents are crazy. They forced me to dress like a boy and cut my hair short. I hate them. Mom and dad looked hurt by my words, but I didn't care anymore. They both got in the car and asked me to do the same, but I said no. So they drove off and left me behind. Miss Vera volunteered to drive me home, but I didn't want to go. 
I begged her to take me to her house as I decided what to do about my parents. When mom called me and I told her where I was, she was outraged and threatened to report Miss Vera for abducting me. Good luck with that. I already turned 18 last month, I told her before hanging up. Tell me about the dress you wore at the talent show. It was really beautiful and uniquely designed. Miss Vera commented while we ate dinner. She listened patiently as I recounted how I made the dress. You're really talented. Have you thought about what you want to do after graduation? My dream is to go to a reputable design school, but I doubt my parents will support me, I said sadly. You know, aside from being your teacher, I also design clothes and sell them. I have a website and everything. After dinner, we opened Miss Vera's website. These are all amazing, Miss Vera. I gushed as I clicked on several outfits. I don't understand. If you can do all this, why are you teaching? Miss Vera smiled at my question. I love teaching. I don't do it for money. My designs bring in a lot of money. I actually have a few people working for me. She told me that she owned a small design company located in a warehouse within our town. How do you feel about spending time there after school? You'll learn even more and while at it, we can figure out how to deal with the situation with your parents. I immediately said yes and a few days later she introduced me to her team. After school, I'd go straight to the warehouse where Miss Vera let me use their scrap materials to practice. I even came up with designs that she liked. Weeks passed and I never heard from my parents. It was like they forgot I existed. I missed them, but there was no way I was going back there. I loved living with Miss Vera. She was kind and very supportive of my interests in designing. One evening, she was going through my sketchbook and came across a particular design she really liked. Erin, I think you should make this dress. I'm sure my online customers will buy it. Wow, are you sure? Yes, I am. I'll have my team help you, okay? We can start tomorrow. I couldn't believe it. I woke up very early the next day and headed straight to the warehouse. It was a Saturday, so I didn't have any classes. The dress took a few days to finish. Miss Vera's team was really helpful and they told me how beautiful my design was. When it was ready, Miss Vera uploaded it to her website. The next day, I woke up and went online to check if my dress had received any orders. But to my surprise, the dress was no longer on the site. Miss Vera must have taken it down. I guess my dress wasn't so great after all. Erin, you need to see this. Miss Vera called from her office. What is it? I responded, walking in. I still hadn't asked her why she removed the dress from her website. She was sitting behind her desk with her laptop open in front of her. I got an email last night. You won't believe who it's from. She turned the laptop towards me and my jaw dropped. It says that Patricia Anderson is interested in one of your designs. Patricia Anderson, the movie star? Wow, congratulations. Erin, please sit down. After I read the email, I called her assistant. Anderson has an upcoming movie premiere and she wants to wear one of our designs to the event. Guess which dress she wants? Yours! No way! She requested that we remove the dress from our site because she wants no one else to buy it. Erin, she's coming to meet you! My heart almost exploded with joy. Patricia Anderson was one of the most celebrated actresses, and I'd grown up admiring her and her taste in fashion. Miss Vera and I met up with Patricia that week. When she asked to see the dress, I was very nervous. Most movie stars were known to be very demanding and high maintenance. I expected her to take one look at the dress and throw it in the trash. She didn't though. She admired it for a while, then told her assistant to write down the changes she wanted to be made on the dress. The movie premiere was happening in a month's time, so Miss Vera and I immediately started working on Anderson's order. A few days before the movie premiere, her assistant met us and took us to the movie star's house. The fitting went well and she was very happy about the result, much to our relief. When she wrote me a check, I took it with trembling hands. But, but this is so much money for just one dress, I told Miss Vera once we left. I was astonished at the number of zeros on the check. I offered to give some of the money to Miss Vera, but she turned it down. You earned it, dear. I was only helping you because of what your parents did. Please, keep the money. Wow, she was such a kind woman. During the event, Patricia mentioned me as her designer. She also mentioned Miss Vera's website as where she first saw the dress. As you'd expect, the site blew up with orders and we became two of the most sought after designers in the city. Months later, I still hadn't made contact with my parents. Graduation came and went and I was now fully working at Miss Vera's company. I was making a huge amount of money from my original designs. I should have been happy, but I wasn't. Despite our differences, I missed my parents. Erin, you have visitors! Miss Vera shouted from the kitchen. I still lived with her, but I planned to move out soon. 
I ran downstairs and immediately froze when I saw my parents standing in Ms. Veer's kitchen. Mom? Dad? What are you doing here? Oh, Aaron, we're so sorry for everything. Sorry? You made my life miserable. Please leave. I know you're angry, but please hear what they have to say before they go. What can they possibly say to excuse how badly they treated me? We had another child before you. Dad interrupted me. What? His name was Aaron, and he died before he was just a few years old. We were devastated and never moved on from the loss. We wanted to replace our lost son. And when you were born, we were disappointed that you were not a boy. So we decided to turn you into our desired son. Mom was crying hysterically now. We're sorry, Aaron. We were wrong to force you to dress like a boy and try to suppress your passion. We should have accepted and loved you as you are. That was incredibly heartbreaking to hear from my parents. They asked me to go back home, but it was too late. My career was just kicking off and I wanted to pursue it on my own. I also plan on going to design school. I hugged both of them and told them I forgave them, then said goodbye. Hey, Harry, looking good today, buddy. What am I even saying? You look good every single day, you lucky handsome dude. Someone said to me as I walked past him. I turned around and flashed him a smile, along with a thumbs up sign. I really appreciated compliments. I continued to walk until I got to the hot dog stand. I was hungry and wanted to grab a hot dog. A few meters away from me and sitting with her friends was Amy. Amy was one of the most beautiful girls I'd ever seen, if not the most beautiful. She had big, beautiful blue eyes and lovely brown hair that grew all the way to her waist. I tried to get her attention by waving at her, but she couldn't see me or she was simply ignoring me. Just then, her friend Amanda got up to receive a call. She distracted herself from the group until the call was finished, and just as she was about to go back, I walked up to her to have a little chat. Hey, Amanda, what's up? I greeted. Hey there, Harry. How are you doing? She replied. I'm all right. I'd like to talk to you for a few seconds, if you don't mind. I'm all ears. Well, I began. I really like your friend Amy, but it seems like she doesn't even know or care to know me. I was wondering if you had any tips on how I could go about it so I'd get her attention and get her to like me. Amanda paused for a moment before replying. Hmm, this might sound strange, but Amy has a weird fascination with guys who have extra white tea. You know, the kind of looks like you've never had a box of chocolates or sweets in your life. Really? I asked, bewildered. Well, yeah. Perhaps if you could whiten up your teeth a little, she might give you a chance. You never know. Thank you. I walked off pondering. My teeth were by no means ugly or bad. But if whitening them was what would get Amy to notice me, then they'd be whitened. A few days later, I was at the dentist's office. The dentist explained that teeth whitening was not a complex procedure. He did it regularly, and my teeth were going to be as bright as possible in the next few months. Months? I needed sparkling teeth now. This was absolutely not what I wanted to hear. I wanted a quick fix, so I got really impatient. What if she was attracted to another guy before I finished all my sessions with the dentist? I told the doctor to give me some time to think about it and left his office. I walked for a few minutes before noticing a nomad who opened up a new stand by the side of the road. In front of it were many items displayed for sale, including containers and jars of creams and liquids. Unable to quench my curiosity, I walked up to her to take a closer look at her items. It just so happened that my eyes caught a particular colorful container. I picked it up to read the label and on it was written, Magic Teeth Cream. I asked her about it and she informed me that it was a very special cream that supposedly had the ability to whiten anyone's teeth to the absolute maximum. She continued that the effect of the cream was almost instantaneous. Wow, what a coincidence. This was exactly what I wanted, so I bought it and hurried back home. I never knew that this was going to be the start of all my problems. Like and subscribe if you're enjoying the story so far. She tried saying something to me as I hurried away, but I didn't bother listening. As soon as I got home, I walked up to the bathroom sink, bared my teeth, applied some of the cream on my toothbrush, and then I brushed my teeth with it. In a mere matter of seconds, I stared in astonishment as my teeth immediately turned a blinding white. I was so happy with its effect that I used a little bit more. The next time I saw Amy, I made sure I got her attention and engaged her in conversation. I also made sure to smile as often as possible so she'd notice my new beautiful teeth. Wow, Harry, you've got really nice teeth. Amy said to me while flashing her equally white teeth. Why, thank you. How come I've never noticed it before? Did you have any work done on your teeth? She asked. 
Nope, this is all natural. Maybe you never noticed it because you never gave me a chance to talk to you. She <laughs> smiled and replied, Well, now you have your chance. We talked a little more before I decided to take her out for dinner. We agreed on a time and place. After our first date, we began to see each other more. She started having feelings for me and we began dating. A few days later, I got up from my bed in the morning and noticed a few strands of my hair on my pillow. I wasn't too worried because I thought it was normal. Besides, I had a full head of glorious hair and it wasn't going anywhere anytime soon. This continued for a few more days before I started to get worried. I also noticed that something extremely wrong was going on with my face. I couldn't quite place my finger on what exactly was wrong with it, but it seemed like I was becoming uglier and uglier as the days went by. This was a very serious cause for concern. I hurried off to look for the strange woman. Thankfully, she was in the same spot as she'd been when she sold me the cream a while ago. What did you sell to me? I demanded as soon as I was in front of her. Young man, I sold you a magic tooth whitening cream. Didn't you read the label? The strange woman replied. Then why am I losing my hair and suddenly becoming uglier? How many times have you smiled? She replied to my question with a question. What kind of question is that? I smile all the time. I don't sit down and take note of every single time I smile. I replied, stomping my foot on the ground. I was getting visibly angry. But in spite of this, the old woman remained incredibly calm. When you brought this, I was telling you about the side effects. But you completely disregarded me and ran off immediately. She shook her head. It seemed like you were not interested in knowing about them. What side effects? I asked, my heart beating rapidly. The strange woman then told me about the supposed origin of the cream. Apparently, the magic cream was made by an ancient witch who lived a long time ago. The witch also made different kinds of creams in order to teach humans a lesson about being too vain, and particular about their looks. She said that the witch made this particular cream for those who cared too much about their teeth, and anyone who used it would have the whitest teeth known to man. But it would come at a price which was that the person would grow uglier each time he or she smiled. I was stunned at this revelation and quickly begged her for a cure, but she said that there was no known cure. Amy was horrified when I revealed all this to her. She'd also noticed that something was wrong with my face, so I had to tell her the truth. She ended the relationship between us immediately. According to her, it was of no use being with someone with the whitest teeth if he had the ugliest face. After being told of the absence of a cure to my magic disease, I resorted to not smiling in order to reduce the effects of the cream, no matter how minimal. I also emptied the contents of its container into the toilet and flushed it. All this combined made me a shell of my former self. I had suddenly turned from a handsome, lively, bubbly, and likable person into an ugly, gloomy, and moody outcast who no one wanted to associate with. I was very lonely. Despite what the old woman said, I was determined to not give up and keep searching for a cure. I stumbled upon a website for magical and mystical things, and it was there I discovered that there was a cure. According to the website, the cure was to find someone who really loved you and accepted you as you were, ugliness and all. This didn't extend to family members. Through all of this, a shy girl, Laura, had been watching me from afar, and one day she came up to me. Hi, Harry, she said. What do you want? I replied dismissively. I just want to talk to you. Nobody ever wants to talk to me. Have you come to make fun of me? I asked. No, I would never do that. I just wanted to let you know that I really like you. Maybe even love you. I've loved you for a while now and I was scared to let my feelings be known to you. Really? You still love me like this? I said gesturing to my ugly face. Of course, I love who you are as a person, not what you look like. Her words touched me, and we soon became friends. And after that, we started a relationship. It was a beautiful relationship, and I was happy to find someone who truly loved me. I was expecting to be cured, but after a few weeks of seeing no changes in my face, I began to worry. It seemed like my face had become worse. I was growing uglier and uglier at an accelerated rate, which freaked me out. And this time, it didn't matter if I smiled or not. Dejected, I broke up with Laura. I felt she was lying to me and didn't really love me. Why did I not revert back to my former handsome self if she truly loved me? She was surely playing games with me or something. Laura, it's over between us, I said to her on that fateful day. Why? What happened? What did I do? Laura asked, flabbergasted. She felt that everything was going well in the relationship and was surprised at my sudden change of heart. I was supposed to get better with you, not worse. 
It said if I found someone who loved and accepted me the way I was, then everything would go back to normal. Leave my house. Laura laughed, weeping. And that was the end of our relationship. I continued to wallow in self-pity until I decided that it was not how I wanted to live my life. I resolved to accept myself the way I was, since there was nothing I could do about it, and stop worrying about my looks unnecessarily. I began to enjoy my life and live my life to the fullest, doing things I enjoyed. Before long, I was comfortable with myself. And one day, while out on a walk, I ran into someone who complimented me. She said I looked great that day. It had been a long time since anyone had said something like that to me, so I was surprised. I didn't understand the compliment until I got home and saw my old face in the mirror. I was cured. I was back to normal. It was then that it occurred to me that what the website meant was to love yourself the way you were and accept your imperfections because they are part of what made you human. I was happy that I had learned that and I decided to never forget that important lesson. On a random day, I was on a street when I spotted someone. It looked like the strange woman who had sold me the cream. I wasn't sure, so I got close, and it turned out that it was her. She recognized me immediately and smiled as soon as she saw me. I relayed my experience and my lesson to her, and she revealed to me that she was the ancient witch that created the creams a long time ago. She said that she had gone through a lot of places over the years trying to teach people an important lesson, and she said that she was happy that I had finally learned my lesson. I was surprised, but before I could say anything else, she vanished into thin air with all her products. I looked around, but no one seemed to notice what had just happened. Everyone who saw me going forward was amazed. Amy even tried to get back with me, as I was now handsome again. Plus, I had kept my snow white teeth. I rejected her instantly and went back to Laura, who thankfully took me back. She was the one who had loved me when I was at my ugliest. I tried to hold on to the bar as much as I could with my sweaty hands, until they slipped. My feet were now the only thing holding me from plummeting into the piranha-infested waters below. I heard a click, and before I knew it, arrows were flying at my face. One grazed my ear, but I somehow managed to climb to safety. Whose idea was it to make training courses realistic? Remember to hit those like and subscribe buttons so you never miss out on one of these crazy stories. I put on my uniform and headed downstairs for breakfast. The table was crowded with my brothers stuffing their faces and slobbering like bulldogs. What are you eating that for? You know this stuff's for men, said my brother Jackson when I grabbed some of their protein bars. I take the same classes as you do. I need to build muscle too, I replied throwing a donut at his face. The rest of my brothers all grabbed their donuts and were about to throw them at me, but I ducked into the kitchen. I heard their groans when the donuts hit the wall and chuckled. Either you boys clean that wall or I make you clean that wall, yelled my mom at them. She kissed me on the cheek as I headed out to school and threw the bag of daggers I almost forgot at me. I parked my motorcycle at its usual spot and headed in, carrying a monstrosity of bags as always. The girls in my year all seemed to have planned to swarm me on purpose because I heard little yelps and squeals of annoyance that I was hitting them with my bags when there was half a corridor of space for them to walk on. I gave up on making friends with them a long time ago, but an assassin academy is not the best place to make enemies. We can whip you up something tasty if you get hurt too bad in class today, Lana. One of the girls quipped. After that, they all headed into their poisons lab. Yeah, I gotta bring all my food and drink from home in sealed containers. I sat in the conference room right-eyed and bushy-tailed as always. My squad leader walked in with a list of assignments and I crossed my fingers under the table. Some of the guys around me were already reading the information about the client and target when they all looked up in surprise as the team leader read out my name. I have a client? I asked, bewildered. I wasn't the only one bewildered. No one around me could believe it either. You were specifically requested, actually, said the team leader. What? shouted my classmates in unison. She's like the worst in class, shouted one. I could barely hear them though. Finally, finally, I had a chance to prove myself. The client requested that I meet him at a rooftop bar. I had to contain the giggles I felt coming on. I walked all cool thinking I looked like James Bond. I saw my client at the bar and sat next to him as instructed. Sorry, kid, I'm not here for fun today, he said dismissing me. I'm here for business too, Mr. Clark your business, I clarified. 
He then fully turned to face me. He asked me if I was Agent Lawson, then burst out laughing when I confirmed I was. My cheeks grew piping hot. I thought you were one of your father's boys. I don't want some girl taking out my target. You can't handle it, he said. He then stood up and wanted to make a phone call without another word to me. I don't know how I resisted the urge to throw a bottle at him. When I got back to the academy, my brother Rick was already on his way to meet my client with a signature baseball bat slung over his shoulder. No hard feelings, kid, he said as he walked past me and ruffled my hair. Now him, I did throw a dagger at. But don't worry, the sheath was on it. I was sick and tired of this place. The girls didn't like me because I took the fighting and weapons classes, the ones they thought too gory and barbaric, while they took poisons and traps. The guys didn't like me because I was a girl and still outdid them in class, though they would never admit it. My brothers were always making fun of me because they were known as my assassin's father's sons and accomplished assassins themselves while I was the newbie. I had all these thoughts running through my mind as I beat up a training dummy in the gym. I was about to go grab knives when I heard the doors open. I wasn't technically supposed to be here alone, so I hid behind some equipment. I expected to hear loud, manly laughter, but instead I heard women's voices whispering. It was a large group of women, women who I had seen around the academy, but they weren't assassins. They were teachers, secretaries, and cooks. And they were being led by… my mom? My feet were glued to the ground as I watched these women grabbing all sorts of weapons and using them with as much skill as professionals. Heck, my mom was better with the flamethrower than my dad. My confusion reached its peak, so I came out of the shadows and marched straight to my mom. I wasn't sure what I felt. Pride? Joy? Betrayal because there was this badass group of female assassins doing what I wanted to do and my own mother didn't tell me? It was mostly the last thing. Mom, what are you doing here? I asked. Her face paled before she took me aside. I should have told you sooner, baby, she said. I'm not just a chef. I'm an assassin on the side, she explained. She told me she only became a chef because she loved knives so much because she and dad had decided when my eldest brother was born that they shouldn't both be assassins. But when you kids grew up, I wanted to go back to work. Though your dad says it's too dangerous. My mom explained. She introduced me to the rest of the group. They were all women who couldn't be certified assassins for one reason or another. So they formed a small organization. They made money by taking the academy's files and taking out targets, then going to the client with proof and collecting the money. I heard a rumor that someone was swooping in on the cases, but I thought that's all it was. I spent the evening training with all of these ladies. They were all impressed by my level of skill and complimented my mom. Then they all huddled together and whispered something to her. My mom smiled from ear to ear. Lana, do you want to join our organization? She asked me. I almost broke my neck nodding so hard. God, I was ecstatic. My mom said she had a client that contacted her personally, and we had a huge job coming up that weekend. I walked around so smug and happy until the weekend came that my brothers were scared I did something to their food whenever we ate. Mom, it's a little cramped in here, I said in my little corner of the porta potty. The weekend had finally arrived, and we had to get to our mission in a few minutes. Give me a sec, she said, applying lipstick while looking in a little compact mirror. I complained that the dresses from the femme fatale department at the academy were so uncomfortable. I am in love with these shoes, though, I said. Then my mom warned me to be careful not to activate them unless I really needed them. I was amazed as we walked up the stairs of the most luxurious museum in the city. The red carpet was full of celebrities and politicians. My first mission and at a gala. My mom and I covered our faces with fans and walked through the entrance as fast as possible to avoid the cameras. Once inside the magnificent hall, some of the ladies from the organization took us to our seats. They were all there in different disguises. There was a black envelope under my mom's plate. She opened it while I kept a lookout. It was the details of our target. Who is it, mom? I asked impatiently. My mom looked at me with wide eyes and a paling face. 
I got worried just looking at her. And then I saw the name. It was the Dean of the Assassin Academy. I started saying, Mom, we can't... When she cut me off saying, We have to. It's the job. We looked around for the Dean. He was sitting at a large table surrounded by local politician and the last person I wanted to see there. My dad. My mom saw him too and I could see the gears turning in her head. She quickly pulled me to the side. I can distract him, but you're gonna have to finish the job, she whispered. I could tell she was worried about me and I was too. I didn't think the target would be this much of a big shot or that I'd have to do this alone. I believe in you. My mom said, stroking my cheek before she went over to greet my dad and the dean with a big movie star smile. (coughs) Meanwhile, the pit of anxiety in my stomach almost made me throw up. I watched the dean all night. There weren't many opportunities, but I was informed that he reserved a room in the hotel next door to take a nap after dinner. Typical rich old man. My mom and my dad were dancing when I gave her a subtle nod saying, I'm on it. She smiled at me and then my dad twirled her away and they were out of sight. I had to find a way into the hotel without being seen. I'm sure the creepiest smile grew on my face when I remembered my shoes. I went outside into the alley between the museum and the hotel. The dean was on the top floor. With the click of my heels, the stilettos retracted into flats and the soles became sticky. I pried them off the ground and started climbing the side of the hotel. When I got to the dean's floor, I made sure no one was in the room before I cut the window with my ring and climbed in. I could hear the dean on the phone in the other room. Suddenly, it all felt too real. I felt faint and was about to climb back out the window when a hand grabbed me and pulled me into the bathroom. I started panicking, but the light turned on and it was… the dean's wife? You have to go through with it, she said. She revealed that she was the client. He's corrupt. He takes good people out when politicians ask him to, she explained. I couldn't understand why she was with him if he was such a horrible person. Do you think he would ever let me be with anyone else? She said. Her eyes growing teary is what really did it for me. I patted the sides of my legs to feel my weapons and walked out of the bathroom. I found the dean sitting in a big leather chair, smoking a cigar like some villain. I also left him in that chair, but he wasn't smoking anymore. I had a lot of mixed feelings about what had happened, but the confusion cleared up when I went back to school a few days later. The academy looked completely different. It was much darker, but less cold. There were books everywhere and portraits and the lessons were louder. I guess the former dean's style was wiped out with him. I heard over the intercom that I was requested at the dean's office. That's when I realized I had no idea who the new dean was. I hurried over there and found the same big leather chair in the office. I could see a hand holding a lit cigar. The chair swiveled around to reveal the dean's wife. I didn't think he'd be so kind as to leave the academy for me, she said smugly. Things are going to be a little different around here now. I grinned at her. This place was due for a change.